You are listening to the Overthinker's Guide to Joy, episode 76. This is the one where I'm going to talk all about moving to paradise. Let's dive in. This is a podcast for overthinkers, overdoers, and overachievers who are tired of feeling overanxious and just want to feel better. I'm your host, certified life coach, Jackie DeCrenis. Hey there, and welcome back. So this week, I wanted to talk about the concept of moving to paradise. And really moving to paradise is just a metaphor for a whole host of things. But this concept came up the other day because I had a client ask me how I ended up moving to Maui after living in Los Angeles for 40 plus years. And I told her the whole story, some of which I've told on this podcast before. But she said, was it amazing? I mean, do you love it there? And was it just like a total change in life? And you know, living on a small island versus a big city is definitely a change of life, just like moving from a big city to the country or, you know, to a more rural area. But I said to her, actually, because I've moved here twice, I moved here 15 years ago, and then I went back to Los Angeles to take another job in television. And then I came back again about seven years ago. So I've been here for a total of 15 years, but it was broken up over these two different stints. And so I had said to her, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And that, and that has nothing to do with Maui. Maui is an incredible place and I now love living here, but I admittedly did not love it my first go around. And part of it was the concept of moving to paradise. And so that's what I wanted to talk about today. So for me, moving here was a little bit of an escape. As I've said probably ad nauseum, the television industry was sort of eating me alive. And as much as I loved my friends and colleagues, and as much as I loved the shows that I worked on and great opportunities that I had in my career, you live and eat and breathe it. And it's kind of relentless and there's no way to sort of get away from it. So your life becomes all about your work. And then the life you try and create outside your work sort of like gets filled in as opposed to the other way around, like having a life and then your work supports that life. So I was clearly very, very, very out of balance in those days. And it was my husband's idea to eventually segue or move somewhere out of Los Angeles, although we didn't expect to do it way back in 2009. I think he thought of it as kind of a pre-retirement plan and then pre-retirement didn't happen. So we were continuing to work, but we decided to telecommute before that was something people did long before the pandemic, long before Zoom, all the things. But it was an experiment and it was a risky one because we both had big careers in Los Angeles. And the question was, could we do them on the phone and via computer? And the answer was, yes, we could, even in the absence of Zoom. But when we moved, I was still very much tied in every possible way to this career in Los Angeles, which meant, you know, I had a staff of people that worked in Los Angeles. My assistant was in Los Angeles. My boss was in Los Angeles. Obviously my producers were all there or all over the country. And so I was kind of physically in Maui, but I was always in LA and I was always thinking about work. And so Maui didn't solve anything for me because I wasn't living this life of paradise. I was living somewhere beautiful, but I was kind of in this locked in a bedroom, you know, all day long on the phone or on a computer and life was sort of happening outside. And part of it was that my mindset was that moving to another place would fix everything. It would slow down my tempo. It would teach me to take better care of my body and my mind. And I had not done the work to do that. So by bringing me to it, I brought my negative energy to it or my overwhelmed energy, I should say, my overthinking energy. So it always reminds me of the quote. I think it was an old quote, but it was made famous in the Buckaroo Banzai movie, which is no matter where you go, there you are. And I read sort of coined that phrase to say, I moved to paradise, but I came with me. So I always caution people when they say, oh, if I just lived there, all my problems would be solved. Now, whether that's Maui or Paris or New York or the South or another country, Italy, France, 
there is this sort of wistful, hopeful thought that if you could just move your location, all things would be fine. Now, in dire circumstances, certainly that's true, right? If you're in a country that's war-torn or God forbid, or something extraordinary like that. But if your life is just your life, that is you have a job, you have a family, or you have friends, or you have a career, moving somewhere else doesn't resolve whatever it is that is haunting you. And so if you have a very workaholic mentality, which I did, or you suffer from overthinking or anxiety, then changing your location might help temporarily, but it's not going to fix the issue. So I was talking with my client who was like, oh, if only I moved to Maui, everything would be great. (laughs) And as I told her the story, and look, by no means do I want to undervalue how privileged it is to have the choice to have lived here and to have been able to telecommute and to have been able to start a second career here. It's phenomenal. But again, it was the mindset that was wrong when I arrived. And so things were just very much the same internally, even though my external circumstances had changed quite drastically. So as I started to tell her this story, she said to me, oh, that makes a lot of sense. She said, when I first moved to a different state with my husband and then small children, she has three kids as well. She said, we had a big, beautiful home and a brand new puppy. And my husband was gainfully employed and I was starting my career and my kids were healthy and happy. And she said, but I felt like I was kind of dying inside. And as she started to explain it, she said, I had everything I wanted, everything I had ever dreamt of, to have a home, to have a partner, to have children, to have a dog, to have money, at least the beginning of an income. She said, it made it worse that I wasn't happy. And it made it worse because I felt so guilty. I felt guilty that I kind of had everything. I had had this unconscious laundry list of things and I checked all my boxes. And here I am in this big, beautiful house and I felt like I didn't deserve it. She said, and then that made me feel worse. So I was both unhappy on the inside, but I was also terribly embarrassed that I wasn't happy with all of the trappings of this beautiful life. And that felt so relatable to me. And so I thought, I've got to do a podcast about this because this is what I felt like when I had my television job. I had a home and I had a husband and I had a dog or two and children and friends and family and an income. And I felt very grateful to have all those things and yet very, very overwhelmed by this life that I had created. And that is a common denominator I hear amongst so many of my clients. I have everything I want and I'm not quite satisfied. And it's not about a bigger house or a different husband or different children or a different dog, but it's also not about living in a different city or having a different career. It's really about doing the work on the inside that led us to being overthinkers, overachievers, highly driven, sometimes type A people that got that laundry list and all those boxes checked. And then what do we do with the feelings when we've been constantly in what we refer to as action mode, meaning I will do this to get this, I will do this to get this, I will do this to get this. And we accomplish, accomplish, accomplish. And then actually the more we accomplish, the worse we feel because we're running out of boxes to check, if you will. And again, it has to do with not doing the work inside. So that's kind of the subject of the podcast today. And ironically, I mean, as I got up this morning and I was thinking about this was the episode I was going to record today, on my Facebook feed or my Instagram feed, I can't even remember, an old Adam Sandler skit came up from Saturday Night Live, which I'm not even sure I ever saw. It sort of looked familiar. But anyway, he's sitting in this cheesy suit and he's sort of got this cheesy little mustache. And in the skit, he's selling, he calls it Roman vacations, Italian vacations. And he's talking about all the beautiful sites that you'll see, historical sites, you'll eat great food, you'll drink great wine, you'll meet interesting people. And he's like, it's a wonderful vacation. We guarantee 
that it'll be a beautiful vacation. We guarantee that you will see everything you ever wanted to see in Italy. And he says, but what we can't guarantee is happiness because that's up to you. And I'm paraphrasing, but it's basically this vacation guarantees a certain level of vacation and we promise to give that to you, but it's not a cure for sadness. If you're a sad person and you come on this trip, you will just be a sad person someplace else. And it just made me laugh. And by the way, not always true because sometimes taking a vacation can really change your mindset and just being in a new location can be a great shift. So I highly recommend going on a road trip, taking a hike, getting out in nature, planning a trip if you need a break in the monotony of your life. But the metaphor of this skit was no matter where you go, there you are. And I just loved it. And I thought that's weird. Like the algorithm of Instagram or Facebook, wherever it was that brought this clip up is reading my mind because somehow it knew that I was going to talk about this today in the podcast. So the question is, while you're in action mode, or if you've already been in action mode all your life, and you might be at that sort of midlife, what often people refer to as a midlife crisis, which, and I've talked about that. Midlife crisis is not a particular age. People used to say, well, it happens when you're 40. Maybe yes, maybe no. Midlife crises can happen at any time. In fact, I have several clients, and I've talked about this as well, that have had quarter life crisis. They reach 25 years old and they break up with their long-term partner or they take a new job because they realize the job that they had planned out of college was not the job they wanted or the career that they wanted. They might move out of their apartment. They might have to move home. They kind of start over and they feel really at sea because they've been in action mode their whole life. I'll graduate from high school. I'll go to college. I'll get a diploma. I'll start my career. I'll get promoted. I'll have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, depending on what they want. I'll get an apartment. Maybe I'll get a dog or a cat. And they do all the things. I mean, it's like a whole life. And then sometimes at 25 years old, quarter life, it doesn't work out. And that can feel like a, again, midlife or quarter life crisis. But I have seen midlife crises at 35, 40, 45, 50. There's no number on it. But this desire for reset or desire to start over or another chapter comes from all the box checking, right? I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, and I'm not satisfied. Oftentimes when we have been in action mode for our entire lives, we are not doing the internal work of good daily habits. And this goes back to, you know, having a routine and taking care of ourselves because we're so outwardly focused of being validated by our professors, our principals, our bosses, our partners, our parents, that we're not thinking about how are we inwardly focused. And again, I'm always careful when I use that word of inwardly focused. I'm not talking about narcissism and I'm not talking about not caring about other people. I'm talking about self-care. It goes back to that same common theme I talk about over and over and over again which is, are you taking care of your body and are you taking care of your mind? And that comes from those good daily habits. So when we start looking for other things to solve our sadness or our malaise or our boredom, when we're looking for that next shopping trip or vacation or house or location, yes, Those can temporarily lift our spirits for sure. And I highly recommend doing something that if it shifts the energy, by all means do it. But running from one thing to the next or thinking that the place you go to or the job you go to or the next relationship you go to is going to solve the inner wound, that's simply not true. So that's something you can control today. That's something you can start with today, which is you can check in with yourself and say, how can I control my well-being? How can I control my mind and my body? And it goes with those good daily habits, which is the homework model that I have created, which is hydration every day, observe your levels, knowing whether you're fatigued, needing rest, or whether or not you are eating regularly and healthfully, meditating, and exercise. And those four principles as part of your daily guide is the beginning 
of good healthy habits. And then, I mean, we can get really in the weeds, although that's for another podcast of what does it mean to eat healthfully? And that's a whole science and a lot of experimentation. But it's those principles where you take back control of your life, where you start focusing on what your needs are rather than externally focusing or self-medicating with so many other things, right? And we talk about that all the time. Caffeine, sugar, alcohol, spending, gambling, et cetera. And so bringing the focus back in, calming the mind and body, and then figuring out what makes me happy. Where do I find joy? And is that in nature? Is that in sports? Is that with friends? Is that helping other people? Is that doing creative projects? Is that being a lifetime learner, taking courses, reading books? And honing those skills and figuring out what are my healthy go-to habits that I want to have in my life every day and how do I prioritize those? That's what makes a well-balanced being so that whether you live in a big city or whether you live in the country or whether you live in paradise, like a small island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So for me, this conversation was a great reminder. It was a reminder of where I had been, which is I had been the person who checked all the boxes. I had been a person who had seemingly it all from the outside but felt like I was dying inside. I was dying from overwhelm. I was dying from fatigue. And I was very, very guilty that I had so much and wasn't happy. And it becomes this negative loop that the more guilty you feel because you have so much, the worse you feel about feeling badly. And so for all of you out there, all of you listeners, who have experienced any of this in your life, whether you've checked your boxes or not, whether you've been moving from place to place or job to job or relationship to relationship, and it never quite feels like you've arrived to where you feel at home or fulfilled or having purpose, I would say, turn the lens inward. Try and work on yourself, on your inside. And see first if by changing your daily habits, you don't develop a different self concept. And then the external pieces. And look, I'm not saying you don't have to change your job or your relationship if it's unhealthy for you, but start with the work inside. And this is exactly what I do with my clients. We start with these baby steps, we start with these good daily habits, and we start talking through where is the emotional wound coming from that you maybe don't feel you deserve this wonderful life you've created. Or somehow, for many of my clients, it's they haven't achieved what they've wanted because they are creating roadblocks thinking they don't deserve the things they dream of. So it can work in both directions. You can arrive at the destination that you had always dreamt of and not feel satisfied, or you can always be hoping that something will be different but you can't seem to get there because you're probably blocking yourself in those achievements. You're probably creating roadblocks because of a thought process of, I don't really deserve this. But either way, that self-care piece is a great way to unlock what is going on with the internal sadness or anxiety or guilt that you might be feeling. So remember this, no matter where you go, there you are. And you can change you at any time you're ready. All you have to do is being willing to look inwards instead of out for the next great thing. All right, friends, thank you for taking the time to listen to this today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Have a great one. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Overthinker's Guide to Joy. If you're enjoying these episodes, please subscribe or follow this podcast so you can always be in the know when the next episode drops. If you would like to learn more about working with me as a coach, you can connect with me through my website at JackieDeGrenis.com. That's J-A-C-K-I-E-D-E-C-R-I-N-I-S.com.